So hello everybody and welcome. My name is Sonia and I manage curation for Harvard's Dataverse and I manage the Murray Research Archive. Um, I have been curating and processing data for about 24, 25 years. I have my team here um, from the Harvard Dataverse that will answer any questions you have. You can go ahead and share your questions on the, uh, using the chat option um, on Zoom and they will be happy to answer your questions as we go. I will try to leave about 10, 15 minutes for questions towards the end. And I will try to get through as many features as I can today, hopefully covering everything that's pertinent and relevant to data sharing. So the Dataverse project, I've opened up a, a few tabs um, to share with you guys today. One is the dataverse.org website. Um, and I will try to make this a little bigger. The dataverse.org project site, uh, which talks about the software and how it can be used. Um, it is available for researchers, for journals, for institution and developers. And I want you to note that we have 60 installations around the world and that each installation decides their workflow and what community of researchers they support. The Harvard Dataverse, where I will be conducting the workshop um, today, is open to the worldwide research community. So if you have data to share, you have a team that has data to share, you have a lab, you're an organization, an institute, a, a, just a regular researcher, faculty, student, graduate student, you can go to Harvard Dataverse to share your data. It is free, of you, free for use, there's no charge. We do have additional curation services for organizations and institutions that are looking for uh, someone to maintain uh, their Dataverse space or their repository space on the Harvard Dataverse repository and to do curation on their behalf. So these are the installations. Uh, the Dataverse product will tell you about the project, how to get started. All of our blogs and presentations and publications based on the Dataverse and curation. We have a large community. Uh, we have community meetings bi-weekly. Um, I'm sorry, we have community calls bi-weekly that you can um, sign up for. And we have the Dataverse community meeting coming up in 2020 in June um, that you can register for online. Um, it's free to attend the workshops um, and the, the meeting. And we will have that, um, we will make that announcement early next week. Uh, where the website will have links to uh, for submitting your proposals um, and for signing up for the workshops and the breakout sessions that we have planned. We have on the dataverse.org some best, best practices that you can um, uh, connect to for information on our policies, community norms, data management plans, replication data set guidelines, and then, of course, we have information about the software. So the goals, the roadmap, the releases, collaborations, integrated tools, the features, the source code, and the guide. We have a large group uh, of community coders, a group of community coders that help us to develop features and add new features and integrations uh, to make the Dataverse software work even better for everyone who's using it. And, of course, our contact. Um, so that you can reach out to us with questions um, and recommendations and um, an interest if you have in uh, personal demos for your group. And I will be doing these demos at least once um, a month so that you have uh, the option to sign up and join and learn about any new features that we've added to the tool. The demo Dataverse is available for you to test our features. So testing should not be taking place on our production site, which is the Harvard Dataverse. It should be taking place in the demo Dataverse. We do review content that comes into the Harvard Dataverse every day, and we remove content that does not um, meet standards for data sharing. So that means it's only articles or the data doesn't belong to you. You're sharing somebody else's information um, or your data contains sensitive information, which we are in the process of supporting, but that tool has not been integrated yet. So we do review our content on the Harvard Dataverse every day uh, for that uh, purpose. In the meanwhile, you can come to the Dataverse on the demo website and you can create an account. Um, it's one account per email, and you can test all of the features that we have available. The Harvard Dataverse 
This is our introductory page through the Harvard Dataverse repository. So this is the repository that is supported, supported by Harvard University, IQSS, the Harvard Library, and uh, Harvard University IT. Uh, we work in collaboration to provide this space free of use to researchers around the world uh, at a limit of one terabyte of content uh, per account. So if you have over that amount of data that you would like to share, if you are a Harvard affiliate, feel free to contact us and we will work with you on that. If you are not a Harvard affiliate, we do not support that uh, amount over one terabyte of data at this time for non-Harvard affiliates, but we can talk to you about how to get your own installation. We have a GitHub community for those who are coders. Um, and if I sign in, you'll actually be able to see it. So here's our GitHub web, uh, website for Dataverse, where you can publish any issues or any feature requests that you have, any bugs that you find, and you can also see what we're working on in terms of features. We have a Dataverse user community on Google that you are welcome to join. As you can see, we're discussing core trust, uh, we're discussing users, uh, things that we're prioritizing. So you can join the community and ask your questions and bring uh, feedback and also suggestions. This is the Dataverse community meeting page that I talked about a little earlier that will be taking place on the 17th, the 18th, and the 19th. And you are welcome to register as soon as this opens up. Um, you'll get a notification if you join our community, if you follow our Twitter account, um, you will get a notification about the meeting, how to sign up and how to submit a proposal and how to become part of the community, okay? So um, to get started, um, I introduced our team. They'll be taking your questions. And we are going to go directly to the Dataverse repository, the production site, so that you can see how to use this software and this repository for sharing your data. So the Harvard support site or the Harvard repository has a front page, as you can see. You can add data by creating your own space called a Dataverse or by just depositing a data set. You do not need to have your own space. However, if you have your own space, you are able to uh, detail your space to support certain metadata and certain searchable facets that work in particular for your team. So you get more options when you create a space, okay? We have the ability to search the Dataverse, the Harvard Dataverse, because people are not only coming for data depositing, they're also coming to find data. Um, so this is one of the points of, of curating your data well, your data set well, is because people will be searching on things like keywords and topic classifications and study titles and authors in order to locate the data that you have shared with us. Again, we have our about page that goes to dataverse.org, uh, which talks about the software. We have a user guide for you that details all of the components available to you, all of the features, including APIs. Okay, so uh, when you want to do anything using an API, we have a, a rich user guide that's available for you to look at. And of course, our support is there to help you with that as well. You have the ability to sign up and log in with different options. And we're gonna talk about those options um, because Dataverse supports one username per email address. We have the ability to log in with Shibboleth. Um, universities and organizations that are registered with in common to use Shibboleth will show up on our Harvard installation um, to allow you to log in with your affiliated um, username and password or for Harvard it's the Harvard key and pin okay that's attached to your university or your institution so um, I want you to take a look at what a typical repository looks like. So here is the Harvard repository. As you can see, here is our logo. I am logged in right now, and I'm going to go to published content so that you are not able to see the unpublished information that's showing up. Um, I'm a super user, so there's a lot of content in here that um, you'll see, but I'm going to log out for now, and I'm gonna work on the demo system shortly after I continue, after I uh, describe this space to you. So when you come to a repository, this is a generic description that all repositories have. They all put in their own, um, their own description and this is ours. Here you are able to share, archive, get credit for your data, and you're able to find and cite the data that you use from this repository. 
Harvard Dataverse offers harvested content from other repositories and from other archives, as well as content that's been put directly into Harvard Dataverse. This left column that you see here, these are called searchable facets. If you come into Harvard's Dataverse or any installation of Dataverse that you use, if they allow you to create your own Dataverse space, your own personal space for your project, your team, your school, you will be able to select the searchable metadata facets that you want to have on your personal space. For Harvard, we limit that, those facets to author affiliation, author name, and subject. Publication year, metadata source, Dataverse category, files, data sets, and Dataverses are all there by default. But because we are mostly a self-curated page, we have selected only to show the subject, the author name, and the author affiliation that all of our users put into their spaces and into their data sets. When you have your own space, if you want to have a searchable facet for keyword, you can add that here. For topic classification, you can add that here. You can, we also have um, uh, geospatial metadata fields. We have social science metadata fields. We have life sciences metadata fields that you can put in here, um, and astrophysics as well, that you can put in here to be searchable on your personal space that we support for you. Okay, so these are your searchable facets. These are just the listings of the data verses, the personal spaces, and the data sets. Okay, we have a contact that you can use directly to reach us, the support team at Harvard Dataverse. When you create your own personal repository on here, you will have the same contact show up on your personal space, and anyone who has a question about your data will be able to contact you. When you first get to Harvard Dataverse, there's this add data option. You have to log in if you actually want to deposit content. You do not necessarily have to log in to access data that's been shared. That depends if the data that have been shared are restricted or open for access, okay? So if I were to click on Dataverse here, this searchable facet, what I would see are all the spaces, 3,850 of the 815 of the published spaces that have been created on Harvard Dataverse. Okay, if I select data sets, then all I see are the 97,000 data sets that have been put in with their respective Dataverse spaces if they created one. So as you can tell, this is actually a, um, we, like I told you before, we um, review the contents that are deposited into Harvard Dataverse every day. And we know that this right here is an article that was deposited today. So we've contacted them that they have to have data. We don't support just journal indexing, article indexing. But as you can see, there's no personal repository space. They just have a data set that they deposited. This is Perspectives on Politics, which is a journal. And this is the data set that was deposited into their space. And then I can come down to subject author, author affiliation, and I can select an author affiliation that I would like to narrow my search down to. It's the same case for the files facet, 661,000 files. I have the Harvard Dataverse deposited files. I have the harvested content that we get from other repositories. It's really only metadata. If you ever get to our harvested content, you will be redirected to the page or to the archive where that data actually belongs. But under the file facets, I'd like you to see that I can look by file type, I can look by file tag, and I can also access what's public and what's restricted. If I look at the restricted content for searchable facets, you'll see this red lock next to anything that's restricted for content for access and has some type of terms of agreement that you have to adhere to or application form that you have to use in order to request the data. Any questions on this while I move on to the demo site? You can, you're welcome to put those in chat. I'm going to go ahead and continue with my 
um, with my talk. So when we create a dataverse, you get certain options. Excuse me. I'm going to log in again because I want to show you what these um, options are. And I'm gonna log into the demo site because I actually created a space here for our training today. So I want you to see that uh, what I used, I'm gonna back up a second. What I used was the login, I already have an account, and I'm logging in with the Harvard University uh, Shibboleth Authentication. These are some of the supported organizations and institutions that can log in with their organizational institutional affiliation information, okay? The other option, and I actually do not want to log in yet, the other option that you have to log into our system is a username or email. This is the actual Harvard production site, GitHub, Google, or Orchid. You just have to remember what you use to log in. If you forget your username or password um, and you put it in incorrectly, you know, the, the system is going to tell you that you already have an account and that you need to reset your password or your username. Oftentimes, user just, users just forget what they logged in with. And if you contact us, we'll be able to tell you which account you use to log in. Okay. We cannot reset your passwords for you. You have to do that yourself. And that's for security purposes. So I'm going to log in with the Harvard Shibboleth. And this is a demo site. And as you can see, my name shows up up here once I'm logged in. <clears throat> and <clears throat> under my login name, I have my data, my notifications, my account information, my API token that you make sure that you don't share with anyone. This is the token that you're going to use whenever you're trying to use the APIs that we have available for data sharing, for data access, for running scripts, uh, et cetera. We have a dashboard that's available for the uh, administrators of the Dataverses of Harvard Dataverse. So you're not going to see a dashboard available to you and the ability to log out. If you do share your API token by mistake, you can just regenerate another one. Now, when I click on um, my data, it's going to show me everything that, I'm, um, that I've been working on, okay? Um, and that's the same way that you would get to your content if you were to create content in Harvard's repository. You would go in, go under your name, go under my data, and you will see everything that you're working on. If you have restricted content in the Dataverse, you will have notifications for when someone has requested access to your data, to your restricted data. You will have notifications about creating new spaces, creating new data sets, especially if you are working with a team. So you'll have this, this area here that you can go to to see the activity that's going on with your account. Even when you create something, it gives you a list of everything you've created and the activities that you've performed on Dataverse. This is a space that's unpublished for now that I created for this workshop. And this is my repository space. I want you to see that I was able to customize it with a generic logo for now. Okay, I have my description and it tells you that it is in the demo Dataverse. These are the breadcrumbs for knowing where you are. As you can see, I have two Dataverse repositories that I created in addition to my parent, because this is my parent. I'm able to create additional sub repositories under my parent, which is mine, to organize my data and my content. I can select the particular metadata that I would like to go in each of these sub repositories that I created. But as you can see, I don't have a lot of searchable facets right now. I haven't added data sets. I haven't populated any metadata fields in my data sets. So outside of the default facets that are showing up, you won't see anything until I actually start publishing it. So what do we get when we create our repository space? When you create your repository space, you get a lot of options. We'll talk about general, gener general information when I do a, a brief um, uh, intro, an actual demo of creating one. But you get the ability to do themes and widgets, okay, that um, are relate to your space. For the widgets, that means that I can take um, my Dataverse and I can put it into my personal space. And I'll show you what that looks like when I do a, the demo. 
there are permissions at every level for your repository space. You have permission settings for your parent. You can set different permission settings for your uh, sub-collections. There are permission settings for your data sets. There are permission settings for your files. So you have three levels of control. Who can add and put content into your repository space? Who can add data sets and publish data sets on your space? And who can access all of the files in a data set versus accessing one or limited files in your data set? Okay, maybe you choose to restrict files, some files in one data set, and others remain open. So you have very different levels of uh, permissions that you can set for control. Groups is another form of permissions that I will show you. So I can have a group of curators. And instead of having a list of 10 curators, I have one group called May 21st Dataverse Workshop Curators, and I can add people to that group. So then I know who my curators are, who my co uh, contributors are, and I can just create these limited groups where I don't have to see a long list of names, but I can just see who I, where I wanna put my individual team members. Data set templates allow you to create templates to describe how you would like your data to be deposited into your space. If you're working with a team, you will want to have a data set template, especially if you have a large number of data sets and you want consistent information to be entered in. For example, you want the title to be written in a certain way. You want them all to have replication data for in the title. You want to make sure that the grant field is required. You want to make sure that there is a consistent note in the notes metadata field or you have terms of access that are going to be consistent for all of your data verses, for all of your data sets. You can put those terms directly into a template so that when your team is adding data, that information is already there. Once they deposit the data set and fill in the other metadata fields that are required, when they hit save, your terms are automatically saved to that data set. They don't have to add it every single time that they come in. You can create as many templates as you need to support your different collections. So if collection one and collection two have different terms of access, I can create a template for collection one, a template for collection two, put in the appropriate terms and save them, and it works the same way, okay? Uh, there is a guest book. If you do not want to restrict your files for access, the guest book is a workaround. What it does is you set up a guest book when somebody comes to download data from your Dataverse repository space that you created, from your data sets. Once they select files and they hit download, a guest book pops up requesting whatever information you chose to ask about, including perhaps maybe a brief proposal. They will fill that out and the files will download for them. On, on the spot, it's instant. What you get in the back end is you get a report of users, which files they access, from which data set. Did they download the file? Did they, do, did they use the online analysis tool? And if you ask for a proposal, you'll have a brief proposal available of what they plan to do with your data. So it gives you some information without, having, um, without requiring that you restrict access to your files in order to have that information. Featured data verses um, is just a way to show your collections at the top of your page. It is only available for published content. My content is unpublished at this time. So once I publish it, I'll be able to feature it for you, okay? So briefly, this is what I created. I have two other empty data verse uh, spaces that I created that I will populate at some time. Okay, I created a, a couple of templates. I created a template for sample one and a template for sample two. And if you want to view my template, here's what I did. I made a note in my description that whoever's entering data for me should include the abstract from the publication and they should link to a DOI for the article in the related publication field below, this one. 
And I said to them that this is required. While I did this in the template, I can actually make this required with a little red asterisk next to it when I create my Dataverse space. So that when somebody comes and puts data into my, into my uh, space, if they do not fill out that, that field, they cannot save the page they are creating. I also put a note in here in my template that says data in this collection will be restricted for use until May of 2021. So anybody who comes in to add data for me for my team will see that note, they will not remove it. When they hit publish for that data set, that note will be there. And I said if there's grant information available, they should add it. Uh, for my terms of use, what I did was I planned on restricting my files. When I add files, I'll restrict them. And then I put in my terms of access that they need to submit a brief proposal to request access to my data to my email. There are several ways to do this. The system allows you to use a feature called request access for your restricted files. If there is a restricted file and someone clicks on it, it will show your terms and tell them what they need to do in order to access your data. But I just wanted to give you a view of what one template looks like for this particular one. Now, I made a template for number two. Um, and I changed the restriction date to June 2022. I put in the keywords. I did not select the default CC0 license that comes with the Harvard Dataverse repository. You do not have to select that license. You can select that license and you can still have restricted access with information on what you want. That's okay. But if you do opt out of the CC0, um, you should put in why you're opting out of the CC0 or why they need to contact you for restricted access. If we come across data sets that have restricted access with no information on how a user can request access, we will contact you to put that information in. Okay, so when you have a Dataverse space, those are all the options that you get. I'm going to show you briefly what that widget looks like so you can have a good view of it. So Gary King, our director, has a Dataverse on Harvard Dataverse. On his Open Scholar page, and Dwayne will include the information on, if you're a Harvard affiliate, how you can get an Open Scholar page in the chat. He'll put that in the chat for you. His Dataverse that is on the Harvard repository will show up in here on his personal space. So then you can get traffic to your personal research space. And when I click on his data set, it will go back to the Harvard repository because that is where the data exists. And this was a linked data set, by the way. It, this is why it's not showing up in Gary's data set, uh, Dataverse. It's a linked collection that we have in his Dataverse. But I want you to see that it comes to the Harvard Dataverse space. Um, if my team is on, can you please take a look at the chat and answer some questions? And Duane, please put the link into the uh, Open Scholar page. Um, Patricia had a question. Okay, so I am going to go back to the demo page and I'm already logged in and what I'm going to do is um, show you a few more features that I'd like you to see the extent of, okay? So again, I'm not going to log into the production site because I don't want the unpublished content to show up. But I do want to show you a data set and the tabs that come with the data set. This is a published data set. Somebody created this directly in the Harvard Dataverse. That means that they did not create their personal space. They just put in a data set. What they get is a citation with a DOI. This DOI will always come back to the Harvard Dataverse. This is a new deposit, so they, they do not yet have downloads, okay? Um, I have a contact email for them. I have the ability, and you have the ability, and they have the ability to share their data set on Twitter, Facebook, et cetera. They put in a very brief description. If you can just put in your abstract, that's a great way to give everybody information about your data set. And they selected a subject, but it doesn't look like they used any other metadata. We'll see in a minute. So you get your full citation with the version, 
number. You can cite your data set in multiple formats. You can learn about the data citation standards that we use from data site. You have a file page and they chose to put in, mainly because they probably had a lot of files, they uh, chose to put in zip files for housekeeping nervous system and TSG. Metadata, they were very brief. This is by default. This is uh, automatically filled in. This you have to select. Description is put in. Here's his information. Use the contact email button if you want to reach them. This is the author. That's the title of the data set. For terms, they decided to go with CC0. They could edit this and change it if they do not want to use CC0. They also opted out of using a guest book. Okay? Guest books are created at the Dataverse level. So if you want to use a guest book, you, you have to create your own personal Dataverse space on Harvard's repository. Because you create the guest books at the Dataverse level, you apply it under the terms of your data sets. It can also be added to your template that you create so you don't have to keep creating it every, creating it every time, okay? And the versions are here. This is the first published version. When you come back and you edit your data set for any reason, it will create either a minor or a major version depending on your changes. What you do not want to do when you create your data set, if you, have, if you are a team of researchers, you create the data set one time in one repository unless you're using another repository to um, support some other part of your data that Harvard Dataverse does not support. Maybe you're using a discipline-specific uh, genetics data, data uh, uh, archive, okay? That's fine. Uh, your authors will deposit the data one time in Harvard Dataverse. If the authors would like to get credit for their data, you put them in the authors field of the metadata, but they can also create, your additional authors can create a space and we can link this one data set to their space. The reason you create a data set once is because you get a DOI that is specific for your data set. If you come in and you need to make changes, you just update this data set. You don't recreate it. If you recreate it, you're gonna lose your DOI. Your DOI is not going to end up with your new study. So you're gonna have multiple DOIs related to one data set, which you do not want. You want one identifier that's supported by us if you're using our system. Um, and this is where you will track all your downloads and all your file downloads and all of your use between the team. Your team can create a space where all of you can put all of the data one time deposit each data set one time into the Harvard Dataverse. I'm just gonna take a break and see what all the questions are. Yes, Dataverse assigns DOIs for every data set that you create. There has been talk about uh, DOIs for Dataverses because some people really make use of the space that they create. That is in, still in discussion with the data sharing community. So right now you get a DOI, not just for your data set, but um, when you have a particular type of file called a tabular file, we also give you a DOI for those files. And I will show you, Valerie, I will um, show you what those look like in an example for tabular files. So you get data set level DOIs, you get file level DOIs when you have a tabular data file. Okay? So this is what, Julian, um, no, you don't, because housekeeping genes is a zip file and you do not get a DOI. It's for the tabular files. You get an MD5 um, for your regular files, but there's no, um, I can take a look at that again, but I'm almost certain there's no DOIs unless it's a tab unless um, unless it's a tabular file. I will check double check on that for you. So, uh, some of the things that I wanted to show you about uh, files, right? So we've talked about data sets, we've talked about tabs, right? Um, what I'm going to actually do is um, I'm going to log in here just to show you some options for your data set. So once you have, so we've talked about the dataverse and everything you can do. 
This is a regular data set. What can I do when I have a data set and it belongs to me? Well, I can edit it. I can add additional files anytime, whether it's published or not. If it's a, if it's a draft format, I can take as long as I need to add files, remove files, fix my data, fix my terms, permissions. I will still only have one version until I publish it. Once I publish it and I come back, I still have all of these options except the private URL. So in draft format, and you see the private URL here, but you can only use this when you have a draft to share it with somebody who doesn't have an account. For example, you have a team member who wants to look at the data set you've put in here before they publish it. There is a private URL feature. You just use that instead of having them create an account and come into Dataverse. You don't need to do all of that, okay? But it's only available when your data set is in draft. I can upload files, I can add metadata. I can add my terms, I can do my permissions again at the data set level, at the file level. Remember, when you have a Dataverse, you have a different set of permissions that you can use there. You'll, you, you'll have your own Dataverse space. Thumbnails and widgets, and I can deaccession my data set once it is published. So very important to note, when you add a data set to any Harvard installation or any Dataverse installation, uh, deaccession is the option that you have once you have published a data set. In draft format, you can delete anything. When you have published a data set, you cannot just delete it. You need to deaccession it. What that does is it leaves a tombstone citation page. So it basically leaves the citation and the reason why this was removed. If it was removed and it was stored in another repository, you can put in the DOI that goes to the other repository. As the administrator of that deaccession data set, when you come to it, you will see the files there. Users will not see your files ever. Okay, so when you deaccession a data set, you can come in, you'll see that it's deaccessioned, you'll see its files. Users will only see a page with a citation and a note that says it's been removed, why it's been removed, was it moved somewhere else, here's the link to go to that other space. So these are your file options. I can link this data set to my own page because I like it, right? It, maybe it, it's related to the research that I do. Now, I cannot forcibly link my data sets to anybody else's space. Just so you know, if you're browsing the Harvard repository and you find data sets related to yours and you want to link it to your page, you can, just a link. Um, you cannot forcibly link your content into anybody else's space. Now, I can explore this data set using Holtail, which I'm not signed up into yet. This is kind of a, the demo is, a, is our test site, so this feature is still being wor worked on, okay? Uh, but there are explore options for the files, not in this one. This is a test file. So I'm going to show you what some of that looks like. So when we talk about, we've talked about how to manage your Dataverse space. We've talked about the options for managing your data set and what you get. So I want to look at all the file formats that are available for you, okay? We've looked at the tabs that we offer you. I'm going to click on the files facet in the Harvard Dataverse. I'm going to go down to tabular files. So here are all the files that we have right now, right? We have a lot. We also have a lot of unknown that we're working to recognize. Uh, Dataverse was fir first built to support social science data, but we get data from everywhere. So some of those files are not yet recognized by our system. But as you can see, we get a lot of different types of files. We have special support for tabular data files. We pull the metadata for the FITS files. We have special support for shape files. Um, using a tool created by the Center for Geographic Analysis. Um, and we're working on providing additional support for all other file formats. But let's look at tabular data files for a second. Your tabular data files are your SPSS files, your STATA files, your CSV files, your Excel files, your R data files, okay? When you bring any of those type of files into Harvard Dataverse, 
so Julian, I'm just seeing it right now. Um, you had the question about the DOI. It does show up just for the tabular files, not for every file, because the zip files did not have them, unless it's particular to zip files not having them, and I'll go back and check. So file citation, here's the file. I'm on the file page. Harvard Dataverse, this is the space that created on perspectives on politics. Here is the data set, here is the tab file that I'm talking about. So for files, I get a file level citation with a file level DOI. I get a data set level citation with a data set level DOI. This UNF is particular to tabular files. All other files will get an MD5. The UNF is the same thing as an MD5. It's a fingerprint for a file. It has a different algorithm. You can read about it on our websites. Um, and it also shows up, if you have tabular files in a data set, it also shows up in your data set citation. You have a combination of tabular files. It'll get recombined into a UNF that goes into your citation. Okay? So here's the file. Now, I have an explorer of the data that I can see what the data look like. And my screen is really expanded right now, so I can't go any lower, just so you know. But I have this explore option. And I clicked on the further explore. I can download the file or I can close the, the preview. And um, Julian, I'm not sure if this is an error when I clicked on that. So you can take a look at that for me when you get a chance. But coming back to the file, I have this explore option. Data Explorer, I can view the data. It has one download. I can also just download the data, but I want you to see that when I hit download for a tabular file, this will not happen with a PDF. It will not happen with a regular file that's not considered tabular. It tells me that the original file was a state of 14 binary file. I can download it as a tab delimited, our data. I can get variable variable metadata, I can do a data file citation in these formats. I'm going to just go to the questions really quickly. Right. Okay, so that is under control. So explore. So again, I can do data explore from here and hopefully I'm not going to get a bug on this. It might just be demo. Uh, but the Data Explorer tool is created by Open um, Scholars Portal in Canada. We work with them. It's an ex external tool. Depending on the size of this data set, uh, it might take a while to open, but this is also on the demo site, so that might be the reason. Actually, it's not on the demo site. Um, excuse me. So, um, it looks like it's still running, but Julian, can you please let the team know that the um, Data Explorer is working really slow for me on production? Thank you. Um, and I also have the ability to do a view data. And this is not working right now for me. I don't know why. It could just be my connection from home since we're all at home. Um, but I'll try to show you the data set when I can. Um, it could also be the file of the data set, but I don't think this file is very large, but let me check. Well, there are a few megabytes. They're not very large. I can try this one. Uh, nope, let's see. So I want you to see that this Stata file right here did not convert, and it's likely because it's a Stata format that's beyond Stata 15. Stata is not open source, so we have to play around with it in order to get it to work with this data analysis tool. So anything below Stata 15 should work fine. And sometimes the formatting of the file, if there's an issue with the formatting, it also will not be ingested. Now, when you see a little error message here, that says um, that your file did not successfully ingest, it just means that it's the format. It's nothing to worry about. It'll show up as a big triangle. Nobody else will see it except you as the administrator of your own space, just so you know going forward, okay? The tool will work with files that uh, it supports. If a file has a different format, if an Excel file has embedded content, graphs, or any uh, difficulty in spacing, um, then it will not work. And that's not a big deal. 
okay? Because they can still download your content in the original format. I can use the download all, I can do original format or tabular format for all of these files. Okay, so if I download all the archival format, I'm gonna get all of the tab files. If I do the original formats, you know, I select everything and I can download them all in the original format. Okay, so this is one of the reasons we ask you not to put in, when you curate data, you should never drop in 500 files um, for somebody to use the download all file, especially if they're large files. Um, it could cause problems if they're large files. It will time out on the download if they don't have a system that can support a huge download, okay? All of your downloads come with a manifest that will let you know if there's an error uh, when it tried to download the files if some files were not able to be downloaded. Now. I'm sorry, slide here? Yes. Um, we can't see your screen. Oh, I apologize and nobody told me. Nobody told me that my screen stopped sharing. Thank you. So what I was showing you was the ability to download all. And what I said was I can get them all in the original format or the archival format. Okay. Now I'm going to show you some more options here. So here is another tab file. It tells me that my file has 19 variables and six observations because this is what we do for tabular data files. This code book, I can explore it, meaning I can look at, oop. They are doing, a, somebody just sent me an email that they were doing some kind of upload, um, update to the system, uh, just so you guys know that I might encounter an error here or there uh, that came from the development team. Um, I'm gonna refresh this page just to make sure everything is working well again. So I'm gonna try this explore for the code book again. because I want you to see that I can just look at the code book here to see if it has the information that I want, right? I can do the same thing with the data file. I can either choose to do the data explorer for visualization or analysis, or I can just view the data. So here's part of the data that I'm able to look at on my screen. Okay. I can download the file, I can close the preview. And then if I go back to the file and do the data explorer, again, it's an integrated tool created by Scholars Portal, a data visualization tool, then I can do a little more, okay? I can do table views, chart views, uh, select my variables. I can do downloads in, in several formats as well here. Get summary statistics. If you have a restricted file, um, they will not be able to download it. They will not be able to do more than a visualization of what's in the file. They will not be able to look at the data in any other way. It's the same thing for an image file. We allow a preview of an image file, a nice big preview. If you have a restricted image file, they will not get that preview. Users cannot look at it unless they have permission. Okay. Um, I also wanted to show you what we have for file hierarchy. So if you have a zip file in folders that need to be preserved, we have a data set here in Political Analysis Dataverse. Political Analysis Dataverse is a journal. They use a controlled workflow that we have available. We have several of those that you can look at. So their authors can submit a data set, but it goes through a review process because they are also using replication verification with Code Ocean. Once they verify that the code and the data that the author has provided actually uh, equals the results that are shown in the paper, they do the reproducibility analysis, then the data are put into Dataverse. So here's one data set. Here is your citation and DOI. Here's your, here are your files, your metadata, your terms, your versions. But what you're going to see is that we have zip files that have been put in folders, and we have a table view, and we have some file paths. Okay? In order to look at the tree, and I knew this was going to stick on me. I've had it open all day. Give me one second, please. 
In order to look at the tree, I select between table and tree, and now I know all the files that are in the code folder, in the configuration folder, in the modules, in the utilities, in the data, in the environment. We have a metadata. There's a Docker file because it's gone through replicate reproducibility verification with Code Ocean. Um, and then um, any other information that they have under the results. So this is our support of folder level uh, zip files. Now, when you put these files in here, you need to make sure that you have a single zipped file. If you put in a seven zip, a seven zip file, this will not work yet. If you put in a tar file, it will not work yet. If you want to put a zip file into our system and you do not want it to extract content and you have no folders, you need to double zip that file or you need to upload a tar file or a seven zip file or some other compressed file. Normal zip files without folders will be extracted. All of the content will be extracted when you zip, when you upload it. Folders that have a zip file that has folders, the table, the hierarchy will show up with a path. Seven Z file, seven Z, Z files will just come in as a seven Z file. Tar files will just come in as a tar file. And No, so Patricia, Dataverse does not create the code book for you, just an FYI. Um, you cannot, uh, you can download your preview, but we don't create the code book for you. Okay. Um, all right, I just want to make sure I stay on my path here. Okay, the next thing, oh, geographic, so then I want to go to geospatial metadata. So we've looked at the file hierarchy, we've looked at the tabular files, now we can just look at some uh, geospatial data. So we use a tool that was created by the Center for Geospatial Analysis at Harvard, and what it allows you to do when you have um, geospatial data is to configure, you can still do the regular explorer that we talked about. You can download the file in different formats because it is a tabular file, but it's geospatial data. So one of the things I can do is I can configure it and I can do a map, okay? Um, this is, so I'm not logged in. It kicked me out already. I was, I was um, out too long. I had this page open for a while. So I want you to see that you will not see that configure option if you are not an administrator. The administrator of this data set from the Bari group, they have to configure it and make it available for me to use, okay? So it's a feature that is limited to the administrator of that data set or the owner of that data set for you to make available for your users. So, but I'm gonna log in because I want you to see how it works. The data set is not restricted for access. Okay, the data set is open. So if I hit configure and map and I'm coming, oh, geez. I'm gonna have to go back to, to safety. I apologize, it's just from, from working from home. So um, I don't want to do anything that might mess up my laptop while I'm here. But you do know that if I can get back to that data set, that you have this option to map geospatial data, okay? If your map does not work, it is likely your components of your geospatial data that needs to be looked at. We have figured this out. Um, sometimes all of the components don't come in the way they're supposed to come in. When you put in shape files, they're supposed to create, you put them in um, either as a zip file that extracts or as separate files, but what it's supposed to do is it's supposed to create one zip file um, that's considered a shape file, okay? And that zip file is going to give you the ability to configure it um, and be able to use the map feature, okay? So as you can see, even though there's some, there are some shape files in here, um, I don't have the option, and this was put in in 2015, which is why, um, but Bari's 
uh, is a great, if you want to see great examples, the Boston Area Research Initiative has really good examples of shape files that work well with the tool. Okay. All right. Um, I want to go quickly to show you some metadata options. So when you put your data set into Dataverse, we've talked about having your own research space, the options for customizing your research space. We've talked about the data set. You get your DOI, your citation, the ability to cite your data set. This one has 596 downloads, nice description. They're using keywords. Here are, are their files. There's a lot of tabular files that I can configure. I can explore. I can download. I can try to configure one of these. I don't know if I'm going to get an error. Yes, I'm still getting an error. So I'm going to leave it alone for now. Um, what I want you to see on the metadata tab is that I can add or edit my metadata at any time. Remember, if you create a data set, Unless there's something really wrong with your data set, like you have sensitive information, um, it's just the wrong file, you can deaccession it. Unless you have those issues, when you come in to change your data set, you just want to hit edit and do whatever it is you need to do, whether it's permissions or terms or metadata or files, and then you publish your new version. That way, you have your one DOI, that, and your versions page will consistently show the changes that you made to your data set to get to the most recent published version. Now under metadata, it shows me all the metadata, metadata that they've put in and the metadata can be exported in several formats. It's Devlin Core, DDI, Data Site, DDI HTML Codebook, JSON, OAI, OpenAir, Schema, JSON. Okay, so all of the data sets that you put in here you put in good metadata, they can be exported in all these different formats, okay? We've talked about the terms page. Bari is using CC0. Now, if I wanted to edit the terms requirement, I'm just gonna cancel out of this. I can opt out of the CC0 and I can put in confidentiality declarations, special permissions, restrictions, citation requirements, deposit requirements. I can put in terms of access if I uh, restrict my files. I can also enable access request so that when somebody comes to my restricted file, there's going to be a little button next to it that says request access. They will have to create an account in order to request access. But I can put in a whole lot of information and they are using a guest book. They're not using it for this data set. And they might not even know that they're not using it for this data set because they did create one. So I'm going to follow up with them. But they do have uh, a guest book. And if we look at their guest book, they are asking you for name, email, institution, and position when you come in to access their files. Okay. So if I canceled out of this and I log out because I'm an administrator. If I select access, if I try to download this, I'm actually not sure um, if their guest book doesn't look enabled on here. I think this is just gonna allow me to download it. Yeah, this is just gonna allow me to download it, but they do have a guest book that would pop up um, if this was restricted in any other way. Okay, now we've talked about metadata. We've talked about terms. You can put in any license that you use. We want your terms to meet your funder's requirements and your requirements for data sharing. So make sure you know what your funders are requiring of your data. Make sure your data are clean. We will be able to support sensitive data with a tool that's coming up in Dataverse 5, hopefully, called Data Tags. It is created by a team at Harvard, uh, the Privacy Lab, the Berkman Law Center, the OGC, um, and it is going to support up to level three. Uh, sensitive data for using Harvard system of, of sensitive data, Harvard's ratings. Um, and it's a color coded system. It's called data tags. You can find it online. And um, all of the data will be restricted, um, but there will be a way for you to share it because the system will be encrypted and will be able to support that data. And it'll be a big announcement, of course, when that's made. 
Now, versions, as I've mentioned before, I want you to see they have three versions of this data set. They don't recreate the data set. They come in, they edit their data set. They started in 2019. The most recent version of this data set was March 10th, 2020. It tells you exactly what they did. If I want to see the difference between these two versions, I can see the difference between the version in January and the version in March. And it looks like files were removed. Files were added, files were removed. So these files were in the January version. They are not in the March version, but these files are in the March version. Everybody wants to see what you've done to your data, how you've changed your data over time. It speaks to the integrity of the data and it shows that you're basically not trying to hide anything um, in this day when everybody thinks that, you know, people are falsifying data or they just want to see what you've done with your data throughout the time um, from deposit to the most recent version that you have available. Okay, so you have a draft version when you start, when you publish it, then you have a published version and you start your versioning process. Okay. Um, so we want to see what restricted and open data look like on the system. I'm going to show you that. So when I go to the files facet on the Harvard Dataverse page, again, it shows me all the information about files. Publication years for those files, the different file formats, file tags, and whether the access is public or restricted. Well, if I look at all the restricted content, if I'm not logged in and I don't have access to those files, they're all gonna show up with this red lock next to it. When you are putting in your data set and you restrict the content, when you are logged in, it's gonna show up as a green lock for you, just so you know. It's gonna show up as a green lock. When you establish features for request access um, and restricted content, log out and look at your data set if it's published and see if it's set up correctly. Or have one of your team members look at it. Um, because as an administrator, there are some features that kind of, you know, they don't show up the same for you as they do for a user. Um, but you, if you restrict files, know that it's restricted as long as you've saved it and you see your little green lock and your request access button should be there, okay? If you're using that. You don't have to use a request access. You can have the application form or ask them to send information to you about who they are before they use your data. Right? Okay. Um, I'm going to stop here just to take any questions before I go back to the demo site and show you the options for creating your Dataverse that will support your data sets. It's very important. So if you have any questions, I'm going to take five minutes in here and you can put in any other questions that we can go through. Or you can unmute yourself if, and you can um, ask your question. Let's see. All right. I take it there are no questions. All right. So it's really important when you're creating your Dataverse space to pay attention to the metadata blocks and the searchable facets that you select. The metadata blocks and the searchable facets are going to allow you to populate your data set. They're not important for the look of your data space that you create. They're important for supporting the descriptions um, and the metadata required to describe your data and describe your files. So when I'm on the demo site and I ask to create a new Dataverse, there are three windows of options that you need to complete. Anytime you see these red asterisks, that means it's a required field, okay? I recommend that when you are creating your content, don't just put in the required fields, put in your affiliation and put in a description of what your space is about, what kind of data is it gonna be supporting. So it lets you know that you're creating this in the demo Dataverse, which is correct. If I create a Dataverse space right now in Harvard Dataverse and I have given you access to put content in there, you can come in here and you can change the name of the Dataverse that you're depositing content into. So you don't have to find my Dataverse space in order to do it. 
I can just come in here and find my space. If I have permission to create it in that space, it will allow me to. If I don't have permission, I'll get an error message. So I'm gonna put this Dataverse that I'm creating directly into my space that I created for this workshop. So I can call it by my name. I don't have to use repository, a uh, Dataverse. I can use repository. Um, I can say um, workshop test space. I can call it whatever I want. You know, I wanna be nice and consistent in my spelling and my grammar, using capitals where needed. Don't use all capitals. Um, it's just not appropriate. Now, that's required, so I'm putting it in. This identifier is going to create a URL that you can share of your space. So I want you to see that Perspective on Politics has a URL that ends in Perspectives. That URL can be sent to all of my affiliates to let them know that this is my space. Once I publish my space, if I change, if I go back and edit and change this perspectives identifier, you will no longer be able to find my space under that identifier under that URL. And there is no redirect. So think well about what you would like to use as your identifier. Um, so I'm just gonna call my workspace, workshop space 2020. That's gonna be put into the URL that I can share with everybody. Um, and they can, you guys can work on this space if you want to once I publish it, right? I'm gonna share it with you. I'll allow you to put in data. Right now, nobody can put any uh, content into this space because that's the setting I have. But I can change it and I can allow my team to come in and deposit data. What category is this? It's uncategorized for now. It is, we have options, department, journal, laboratory, organization, researcher, research group, research project, teaching course. I'm just gonna go with uncategorized for now. My email is automatically populated because in order for you to create a space or to add data, you have to create an account and log in. I'm affiliated with Harvard and I, of course I'm gonna add this. Storage by default is here. When you are in Harvard Dataverse, it's going to say S3, which is the cloud, okay? Uh, so unless we have an additional storage space listed here, you don't really have an option to select a different one. But we are working with repos uh, remote repository storage um, as an option for later, so that if you have some files stored in another established repository um, or space, then we would be able to store those files there. I think that's how that works. So um, always add your description. Um, one thing when I'm looking, when I, as a curator who's reviewing the Harvard repository, when I'm looking at what you put in there, um, if I don't see a really good description, I don't really know what your data set is about. Users are gonna look at your data the same way. If they find a data set in your discipline that has good descriptions for their space, their data set, good metadata for their data set, good description of the files, they're gonna choose the ones that are well described to use instead of yours. So the best, the better you describe your data and your content and your space, the more likely somebody is able to make sense of what you've put in there to use. So that's the first section. You name your space. I can change this at any time. It will not change my identifier, my URL. This will change my URL. So later, if I decide I want to call this the May 22nd Dataverse Workshop, I can. Okay, my URL is not going to change, just my Dataverse name. It's arbitrary. Okay? My, sorry, this one right here. Um, the next spot, the next space here is the metadata field. Now, your metadata field, you want to select all the metadata blocks that are going to support the data that you have to describe. So I'm going to click off of the May 21st workshop. I'm going to say, uh, I want you to note that citation metadata is always required. I can view the fields here. So I'm going to say that this data set is mostly social science and geospatial. The data sets that I want this space to support have social science metadata and it has geospatial metadata. 
So I can look and see what the geospatial metadata are. Maybe I want to make some of these required because I have a team and I want to make sure that my team, when they're adding data, fill in these fields. Others can be optional. If I want, I can hide geographic unit. It'll never show up in my template. It'll never show up to the people entering data for me. And I can also hide the geographic bounding box. All right? I'm just going to select done there. For my social science, if I look at it, these are, the re these are the fields I have to select from. It's quite a lot, okay? I'm going to click off of notes and this. I'm going to click off of all of these. I don't want them to show up because I know I'm not going to fill them out, okay? But I do want unit of analysis to be required. I want frequency to be required. Everything else is optional or it's hidden. All right, and I'm done. So I've selected the metadata that's sufficient for whatever data I'm going to put in here. Now, if you looked at the space that I had before, I had some sub spaces that I created for collection one and collection two. I can have a whole different set of metadata options for collection one and collection two of my different sub samples. I can create as many of these as I need under my personal space, okay? And then the last one you have to do is your search and browse facets. So I want my facets to match the metadata blocks that I searched, that I, that I selected up here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click off of this option here, which is to use the default setting for my parent. I'm going to click off. I'm going to go to geospatial metadata, and I want to make sure that these blocks, if I selected them up here, that I'm going to put information for them. I'm going to fill in the metadata field so that they're searchable when somebody comes to my space. I'm also going to go to social science because that was the other one that I selected. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to push these metadata facets over to the selected block. I want you to see that author name, affiliation, subject, and I think keyword and deposit date and distribution date were already there because I had set them at my parent. So this is a different collection that I'm using. All right, I set them here, but I'm creating an additional space. I'm gonna create my Dataverse. So under my May 21st Dataverse workshop, I had collection one and collection two, but now I also have my workshop test space that I created. Here are the options that I told you about before. General information, themes and widgets, permissions, groups, templates, guest books. General information is where I created this space, workshop test space. I can come in here and change anything I want. Maybe after I created, I realized that I needed some life science metadata. So now I select the life sciences metadata. And then I decide that I didn't like my Dataverse name. So I'm going to say workshop collection five. I didn't like the name I had before. Notice that I'm not changing my identifier. I've selected that additional metadata. I'm going to come down here and I'm going to select life sciences metadata. And the only thing I'm going to show here are these particular cells that I'm going to fill out and I'm going to save my changes. So my URL is still here, workshop space 2020. Now it's called Workshop Collection 5. And I have three spaces that I've created under my regular space. If I don't like my regular space name, I can come in here, General Information, and change it. This was my original space, OK? Use the breadcrumbs to come back. Now, if I were to publish this, now I can publish all of my spaces that I created. And then I'll add a data set in there so you can see what that looks like. So what I did was I published the three spaces that I created. Everything here is published. Now when I have everything published, the featured Dataverse option is available to me because I told you it was not available in draft format. So now look at my space. 
Now I have my workshop space and I have the three collections that I, I created featured here. And then what I'll show you is what that looks like when you actually customize it well and you add content to it. So if pre is one of our bigger users and here's what their space looks like. They did the exact same thing I did. They created their space right here. They customized it. They put in their description with links to their terms, their policies. They created these additional spaces and they customized it. Now they populated their data, their dataverse space and look at all of their facets. I can search by unit, I can search by coverage, province, nation, series name, keyword, topic classification, publication year. I can look at their files, their data sets, or their other spaces that they created. So if I were to hit keyword Africa, then I have 97 results. Now, it's interesting to see that they actually had some keywords that were repeated because they have a management team that pays attention to that. Um, and I know they use templates as well so that everything is consistent, but I want you to see that I narrowed my, my results down from quite a few data sets to 97 data sets by using their setup, their facets. Okay? And they also have a lot more um, metadata that they include for their data sets. So now that I've done all of this, I know that in workshop five, um, I created kind of a, a special metadata block that, uh, or metadata that a field that I'm gonna use for my data set. So when I come to my space for uh, workshop five and I say new data set, here's all that's required for your data set. Title, author, contact, description, um, subject are all required because a lot of this information goes into your citation. So you have to add a title. If I want to add a replication data for to my title, I select this button. Now, what does a replication data for mean here? It means that I am putting in my data files and my code and that if my, and I'm putting it in because my data set is reproducible. I'm not gonna put it in if it's not reproducible. I'm not gonna use this if my data set is not gonna be reproducible. Instead of this option, I could use data related to or data for. You only use replication data for if you are, if you have a reproducible data set and you're putting that information in here so that somebody can reproduce it. It pre-fills your author name, your contact, because you're logged in, add your description. Keyword is required, okay? You can search or you can use what we have available right now. Business and management is what I'm gonna select for now. I have keywords that I can put in, that was subjects. I have keywords that I can put in. And for as many keywords as I put in, I can use this plus button to add more keywords. I can also do this in my template like I showed you that where I already pre-added them so somebody doesn't have to add them for me. Related publication field when you're putting your data set in. The related publication field is the bi-directional link between the data set you're creating here and the article that was published in a journal somewhere. So normally when you create your data set on Harvard Dataverse, you take the DOI or your full citation and you send it along with your article to your journal. Your journal will include your data set DOI and your journal article. And then you take the journal article DOI and you put it in here, hopefully before you publish your data set, but that's not a lot of the workflows for journals. So if you have to publish your data set first, make sure the journal has your DOI for your data set. When they give you the DOI for your article, just come back to your data set and hit edit and put in your related publication that goes to your article and just save a new version and publish it. It's a minor version and you'll save that and publish it and then you have the link, the bi-directional link between your article and your data, okay? Now, 
these are not all the fields that I selected when I created this space. I had life science, I had social science, and I had geospatial metadata. However, because we want to make it easy to deposit your data, we ask for the required information, a few additional metadata fields, and then we go right to adding your files. So I have some files that I put in here um, for this workshop, and I'm just going to select all of them, and I'm going to upload them. I can upload by uh, drag and drop. I can upload by um, going directly to my uh, file, to my um, directories. I can also use Dropbox. Um, and here are the files. So I have a preview for my image file. I have a stata file, two stata files that I expect will be um, converted to tabular format. And I'll be able to do data analysis and exploration because they're stata files and they should be ingested. Okay, so I've uploaded my files. Then it tells me after adding my files, I can come back to my data set and add more metadata. Okay, it's curating a data set well. If you have time to do it in a day, great. If you don't, you have the option to put in your files so they are preserved and you have your citation. The citation and the DOI that you have when you create your draft is the same citation and DOI you're going to have when you publish that same draft. So you have time to come back and make sure you curate your data well, that you add descriptions and tags and any other thing in provenance for your files um, and anything else that you want to add to your files and your page before you publish it. So right now, I'm just going to save it because I have my data sets, my files in there. And it says that my data set is locked because the tabular files are being processed. You have to wait until those tabular files have been ingested before you can continue your editing. And my explore option is already starting to show up. It's draft, it's unpublished. Here are my files and it tells me, so this one is not getting, actually this one was already ingested. This one's taking a little longer, but it'll be ingested any minute now. I have my number of variables, my number of observations. I have my UNF, which is like an MD5. For my image, I get an MD5 and I get a large preview of my image. This one is still taking its time. And oftentimes it'll refresh on its own I don't wait for too much, so I just refresh my own. So this one has 33 variables and 248 observations. Here are my files. Now that I have my files, I have options to delete files, add additional metadata to my files, restrict my files, or add tags. So if I want to restrict one file, say I select this one. I go to this, edit files, and I restrict it. When you restrict a file, it's going to ask you to put in the terms of access. As I said before, if we see files that are restricted with no information about how that file can be accessed, we are going to contact you to put in that information. So I'm just going to put this in real quick. And I'm going to enable an access request. Well, I'm not going to enable the access request. Um, I could so you could just see what it is. If I'm telling them to contact me, I don't need to enable access. If I'm not telling them to contact me, I can enable my access request. That means that when they use that button, it will send an email to me anyway. Now, I restricted my file and I see my green lock because I am logged in and my notifications have increased to 40 because I just created more content. I can download these files and all of these options. I can explore my file with the data explorer. And it's still processing for me. So, but here are my table views and my chart views for now, okay? Um, 
And I can select my files because I want to add more description. I want to add my description. Do I have a file path? No. This is final image for data set, right? I'm just giving them, you know, uh, data for parents and children. And I can say that this one is data for teachers and students. The more information you give, the better. And I'm going to save these changes. And now you see I have my descriptions. If I want to add tags, I can select all three. And I'm just going to say that it's data for now. But I can give each one its own separate tag. Now I have three tags that say data. So I can give one data, one documentation, one code. Okay? If you have any um, other information you wanna put in here, you have the option to do it here. You select a file and you edit. Okay, so we created a space. I didn't do the customization here because I did the customization here, but the customization is really easy. So here's my one data set. As you can see, I have not published it yet. I can publish it whenever I'm ready to publish it. Um, it's located under workshop five. This is the space it's located in. This space is empty, this space is empty. Now, I want you to see my facets have grown. I have three data versus one data set. I have three files that I can um, see here. It tells me that I have two files that are public, one file that's restricted. I have uh, three that say data, data. I have a tabular file, I have an image file. So now, I'm actually starting to incorporate some searchable facets into my space. If I'm looking for a keyword that says add one, two, or three, it's one data set that has that. I only have one data set. As I populate and add more data sets, my facets will increase and my ability to search between my content will also improve. So I've covered quite a bit. Uh, what I'm gonna do is just open it up for any questions and otherwise, and I see that there's a lot of questions, but I can go in and see that if there's anything I need to ask, to answer. And then um, if you have any other questions, we can take this time to do questions. Thank you, Valerie. Um, so, um, is, Ann, is it Ann Kawasaki? That's still on. She asked if I have any data quality check processes. Um, so I'm going to go to the question about data quality checks. So um, what we do is, like I said before, we check everything that comes into Dataverse to make sure that the file is working well with the system. So if you've put in uh, tabular files, um, we might be expecting those files to work with the ingest feature. If they don't, you might reach out to you and say, you know, if you used state of 14 instead of state of 15, you can use the data analysis tool. You have to be very careful because the code, we know that the code for state of 14 uh, does not work with the data if you save it in state of 13, okay? Things like that. We prefer your data to come in in the natural format that it's in if we're gonna have those kind of issues between code and data. Um, we check content for sensitive data. So we can usually tell by the information that's coming in and by the description and the metadata um, whether or not there might be sensitive content. And we will reach out to you and ask you if you have done a quality check for sensitive data. We will go into the file, depending on the field you're coming from, and check to make sure that your data have been cleaned. We will not do it for you, but we will check and we will provide you feedback and we will show you um, the HIPAA guidelines for de-identifying your data. Um, in terms of searchability, when you go to the Harvard Dataverse, somebody was asking about 
what's searchable, the description of the data set. There's an advanced search option that lets you search dataverses, data sets, and files. The description I don't see listed in here. Um, Julian, are you on? Yes, I'm on. Can you hear me? Um, yes. So Ming Tao was asking if the description for the data set is searchable. It oh, looks okay. like it is at the top. Ah, here he goes. I missed it. That's I data, apologize. So actually, that's but this is the description right? of the data verse. Oh, okay. So the description for the uh, citation metadata is here. Data set citation metadata description text is here. So I see it actually right here. I missed it myself. So the description is searchable, okay? But the advanced option for search is what you should be using. So there's a regular search button here. Then there's the advanced search. Now, because it's a self-curated repository, this is why we ask our curators and during our workshops, we really press about providing a lot of metadata and a lot of information because you're sharing your data not only because you are required to share your data, but you would like somebody to find your data and use it. And if you full, fill in as much information as possible, then your data becomes something that users will find right away when they're searching. Very welcome. Any other questions while we're here on files or versions or uh, terms of access? PIDs. Um, if I have you guys muted, I'm going to try to unmute you, but I don't know what I did. Oh, can we put other PIDs that we already have? Yes, you can. So when you're actually adding a data set, uh, let me show you. Uh, if I add a new data set, where is it? <clears throat> Actually, let me go to one that's already in existence because I use that field all the time. So if I go to my data set after I've created it and I do edit metadata, I have um, an other ID. Um, I'm still sharing my screen. So I have an other ID option here. What it does is it shows up after that initial create data set page that I told you about, where it only asks you for minimal information and then it asks you to add your files. Once you've created a draft and you go back to edit that data set, that is where your alternative title, subtitle, alternative URL, other ID, shows up. So you can put in, you know, another agency and another identifier. Okay. Um, I'm trying to see what else will show up after. Um, so topic classification is here, related publication. With your related publication, you can put in and link to your other IDs. It has DOI, handle. Okay. So as you can see, when I came back to the data set that I just created, I have all of the other metadata fields that I had selected and wanted to include. And I have my geospatial, I have my social science and humanities, and I have my life science metadata. So you do have that option, Patricia. Uh, any other questions?
I'll give it a couple of minutes. And if people have questions, we're happy to stay around and answer them for you. Um, if you don't, that was our completed workshop today. Um, I appreciate your patience as we're trying to do these on Zoom because I prefer the, to do these face-to-face. -face and um, don't know when that will happen again, but for now, uh, we try to improve these uh, every month. Um, and you're always um, afforded the, the, the you know, um, option to contact us if you have particular questions on a particular, you're very welcome, Joseph. If you have particular questions on any of the features, um, we're very happy to demonstrate just that feature for your team. We still do uh, personalized demos for people. So if your group reaches out to us, we can set up a demo particularly for your group to talk about the kind of data you have and how those data should be brought into Dataverse. If it requires any cleaning, talk about organization. So we have these consultations that we do um, to navigate you. You're very welcome, Richard. Um, to uh, walk you through any questions that you have about the best way to present and share your data while meeting the guidelines uh, from your grant and your own guidelines that you might not have, have considered uh, when thinking about sharing your data. You're very welcome, Patricia. Thank you all for attending. It's always a pleasure.